having a view is the most important thing and then trading that view. There's nothing worse than say, oh, I thought it was going to do that and I didn't do it. You didn't follow through on your view. That beats you up psychologically. Right. You start to get self-doubt. You have to take your view, right or wrong, because it's a very, very important validation thing as a human being. So going in and doing your analysis, working out, okay, I have a very, very high conviction towards this particular investment and these are the reasons why my conviction is so strong. And it's important, again, not to be bloody-minded and go down with the ship. I had a former employee and I say, former because we chopped him for this very reason that was immensely stubborn for no reason other than trying to save face and ego protection you've got to be objective but if you've got a strong conviction towards something you have to follow that through because it will gnaw away at you something cruel if you don't Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are looking at portfolio rebalancing. This is an incredibly important area to take on board to help manage risk and also to help manage your emotion in the decision making. The more process you have and the less emotion, the better the outcome. Plenty of information to take out of this. So as always, make sure you don't simply take notes, make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my co-host and offsider, Mitchell Renshaw. Thank you, Mr. B. Good to be here, my friend. Now, we've got a technical, yet yeah, really interesting podcast, because I know there's a lot of investors in this space that always wonder about this topic. Now, courtesy of our clients and good friends, Stu and Jill, they've provided this topic for us for discussion, mm. which is how to rebalance or balance a portfolio. Great question. And, and look, it's usually a first world problem. It means one of the assets is typically done you know, quite well within that portfolio. Uh, and I guess the basis for, for this conversation is one about risk management, which which is crucial to any kind of successful investing. And, and two, I think is it, it really, really does open up the, the psychology of investing too. that sort of fear and greed uh, gland that can be squeezed, prompting you to make certain decisions and uh, and the nervous side of the equation, too, which can prompt you to make decisions for the wrong reason. So. We'll give a process out. Hopefully that helps give people some objectivity and removes that emotional challenge for them. So some framework around this then, AB, what is portfolio rebalancing for any listeners here unsure? So, so let's say you've got a 100 grand portfolio uh, of shares, for argument's sake, and you've got 10 uh, holdings in there of 10 grand each. So you've got an equal weighting uh, to all of those assets. Obviously, that's not going to stay static for very long because some stocks are likely to do better than others, which results when you take the value of that portfolio. Let's say the portfolio jumps over a couple of years to 200 grand. Technically, each one of those weightings should be 20 grand each, but it's not going to be that. Some might be worth 30 or $40,000 and some may have gone the other way and be worth eight or $10,000. So it's how you treat that to ensure you keep it on a level playing field to ensure that you don't have too much exposure to any one given asset. You pull it back to that sort of central tendency, if you will, that that average of having a weighting across all assets. A lot of fund managers, hedge fund managers, even analysts will provide reports on being mm. overweight or underweight. Too right. Is yeah. there a reason that they do this and how often do they do this? Yeah, look, I, I, I'm not necessarily the biggest believer in having a balanced portfolio for, for the sake of it. And, you know, there'll be other people that say, you know, having a diversified portfolio is most important. But, you know, if you, if you diversify for the sake of, of diversification, so let's say, you know, in Australia, you might choose to uh, have the likes of, say, Telstra, which has been a perennial underperformer in your portfolio, just so you can say we're diversified, we've got exposure to telcos, when in reality, getting your money to grow might be far more better uh, return-wise, focused on having a heavier exposure to banks or resources at certain times. So why you'd want to take something that's an underperformer in there just to give you diversification, I've, I've never been convinced of. So when it comes to uh, reports you'll get from your fund manager, they'll look at, say, uh, what a composition, let's take BHP, might be of the ASX uh, top 30, for argument's sake, or top 50 or top 100, top 200 if it's the XJO. And, and BHP might... Uh, on, on, on an index measure be worth about 8 or 9% of, 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 of the ASX 200. And in your portfolio, you might have 15% BHP. So it would suggest that you're overweight about 6% more BHP than what you should have if you wanted to have a balanced portfolio. Now, you may have a very strong view. You might be bullish on iron ore and resources in general, um, in which case having more exposure to that stock makes sense to you. So in terms of the factors that would involve the decision-making around portfolio rebalancing, our goal for all of our clients, of course, is that they become self-directed investors and traders. So let's assume you're making this decision or these decisions yourself. What elements would go into discussing what you would do, how you would overweight, underweight? 
I think you, you have to have a process behind this, number one. Uh, as soon as you, and I alluded to this at the start, as soon as you allow emotions to come in, and oh, wow, it's broken out, it's going, it's going, what's going to happen next? You can already tell from my tonality, even though we're not in front of the market right now, there's a level of excitement and emotion toward the way that you're feeling about that particular asset. And when you bring a, a level of emotion to decision making, particularly in finance, it very rarely pans out that well for you. So parking emotion out of the way and getting back to a process which over time you can develop uh, and, and finesse, if you will, to work specifically if your needs is key. So, you know, why would you want to have a balanced portfolio in the first instance? And I've mentioned that it's not necessarily the lens I typically look through. In fact, um, you know, if I look at my current holdings, I've got a couple of, and we'll talk more about that a little later, I'm sure, where I've got some really big overweight positions towards a couple of stocks relative to what would ordinarily be uh, a, a, a more diversified type portfolio. And the reason for that is the view that I have on that asset is very, very strong. So if you go back to some of the training that we provide for our clients uh, at all levels within our ecosystem, um, Having a view is the most important thing, and then trading that view. There's nothing worse than, oh, I thought it was going to do that, and I didn't do it. You didn't follow through on your view. That beats you up psychologically. Right. You start to get self-doubt. You have to take your view, right or wrong, because it's a very, very important validation thing as a human being. So going in and doing your analysis, working out, okay, I have a very, very high conviction towards this particular investment, and these are the reasons why my conviction is so strong. And it's important, again, not to be bloody-minded and go down with the ship. I had a former employee, and I say former because we chopped him for this very reason, um, that, that was immensely stubborn for no reason other than trying to save face and ego protection. You've got to be objective. But if you've got a strong conviction towards something, you have to follow that through because it will gnaw away at you something cruel if you don't. Oh, yeah, we've all felt that. Mm. So if we come back to trading your view, portfolio objectives, mm. and your desire for what, how you want that portfolio to perform. So if we take, for example, someone in the space where they might need income, mm. then how holding stocks which pay a higher dividend yield would make sense to be overweight in that example. You would. You'd, you'd, you'd try and target stocks that either had nice, juicy, fully franked incomes, which in the case of a, a particularly for a super, would be brilliant stocks to Indeed. have. Indeed. Um, but also optionable stocks in a lane of, of covered calls or cash flow on demand having a skew towards the stocks that are much easier to write options over that perhaps offer a better income flow more regularly makes sense compared to having stocks that sit outside of that framework. Yeah, and, and there are certain listed stocks in Australia that are big caps. They're not, not, not emerging companies. They're really large caps, but they're very, very difficult to trade from an options perspective. And so as a team, we're far less likely to hold those in our portfolio because they don't facilitate options work very, very easily, which is the mainstay uh, of our strategy. Gotcha. So, so there's a stock, and you know, if you take um, you know, you know, on the ASX, if you took something like Cochlear, for example, which is a great stock, but trying to, trying to work options around that is relatively difficult compared to, say, CBA or, or BHP. Indeed. Uh, and so it may be a great stock, but the objective is slightly different. You can only hold it either for dividend or capital growth, whereas in the case of CBA or BHP, we can get dividends, capital growth, but also that options income, which is really, really important to our portfolio clients. Indeed, which would differ if your sole focus was capital growth. Mm -hmm. You'd probably have, say, for example, some more smaller cap stocks in there, which have a Correct. greater degree of upside, but a higher amount of risk. Mm -hmm. Next point on there, which I think we need to address, is when you're making the decision to trim holdings or increase them, would be your risk appetite naturally, right? Mm. It, 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 it's crucial. When you've got all your eggs in one basket, uh, that, that can be something of a disaster for you. So if I go back to one of the overweight positions I'm carrying right now, that's towards the NASDAQ. And so I've got a very, very large position in a single asset, which on a risk management perspective, you can go, well, you know, compared to all the other assets you hold, it's dwarfing it. Yet at the same time, that NASDAQ position I'm holding is over 100 different shares. So even even within itself, it's actually diversified to 100 stocks. So one unit, but 100 stocks of exposure. It also facilitates my 
first for options premium because the particular derivative I'm trading on that is quite a geared exposure, T triple Q. So I'm getting great premium. I've just sold some puts to get reset on it. I just got exercised 8% over a couple, yeah, a month and a bit. Nice, nice trade, nothing spectacular, but just good consistent cash flow. So it suits me to have such a, a, a meaty chunk in there. Plus my view uh, towards that particular instrument is, is far stronger in terms of conviction than it would be to any single stock because you've got a, a, a strong economy. Um, you've, we, we've got, okay, there's some political change afoot in the US, which, which will determine what the, the longer term trajectory of that is. But you know, technology isn't going to be a smaller part of the future. We all know that. In fact, you know, just recently, <laughs> going off topic slightly, but I think it's relevant. Um, I was doing a talk to a group of fairly seasoned, I'll be polite when I say that, investors, a little bit older, a little bit more conservative. And I was saying, like, you know, this is why I've got this position. And there's a lot of arms folded in the room. I said, like, you obviously aren't necessarily on the same page with me here, which is fine. That's why markets are so great. We can all have our view. Why is that? They go, oh, you know, it's all technology. It's all risky and it's all newfangled stuff. And I said, OK, that's an interesting perspective. Let, let's look at bringing that up to speed. And we talked about some of the stocks, for example, that they've in their portfolio, BHP being a store. For most of them, it's just having to settle a massive legal case right now, which is clearly not going to be great for the stock. But I asked them the simple question. I said, how many of you have used an iPhone today or used Microsoft in some way, shape or form, Googled something, watched something on Netflix in the past month? And this is a demographic that technically shouldn't be in that space, maybe used an Uber uh, and, and so on and so forth. And all the hands were up. And I said, this is where people live. And these are the companies that people use these days. So in the past, you might have seen it as being more speculative, but it's where the economy sits now. So that view has kind of shifted a little bit. So there's an example where sometimes you've got to bring your view up to speed and away from what your personal beliefs perhaps might have been in the past to where life is now. The third one on here as well, just to add to that, I think importantly is time, what mm. your time horizon is. If we look at our situations, mm. uh, you know, I'm young, income relatively healthy. My focus is not on income generation necessarily out of investing. It's purely out of speculative capital Mm. growth with a very high risk appetite due to the fact that I've got so much time left. Mm -hmm. That would be very different in your situation and for any of our listeners. So how do you combine view, objective, time, risk appetite to have a portfolio that suits that? Well, risk is an interesting one if we isolate that because risk in a normal financial planning context is typically determined by someone's age. And you've rightly said you're at a stage in life where it should all be about growth and risk doesn't really matter because you have a lifetime ahead of you, touch wood and hopefully to, to, for, for for any, anything that went wrong to be able to be recovered. And yeah, I'm a little older than you. So technically my investment profile should be more conservative. And I guess the advantage that I have is that my attitude towards risk is perhaps a little bit more honed because of the skill set I have in terms of either laying risk off, managing it effectively or understanding the DNA of markets a little more. I'm not going to say entirely because I think only a fool would say that would be a naive thing to say. Um, And so I'm happy holding assets which perhaps aren't necessarily aligned to what on paper may be my age risk profile because the counterbalance to that is my skill set. And this is why I've been such an advocate over the last 25 years for educating people to enhance their financial literacy and their financial skill set so that they can the biggest risk of all is not knowing what you're doing and and so holding something that's a a geared nasdaq asset probably isn't appropriate if i sit down with a financial planner luckily i own a financial planning business full of very very good advisors that are able to understand these sorts of things and and, and as a consequence yeah i'm skewed that way just just to take risk as as an 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 element of this so you'll be very careful that this is the general track which is where most financial planning advice sits, this is where most people are, but there are also outliers for, for, for different reasons. Equally, um, and this is a real risk for people, if, if for example, you're, you, you are under provision for retirement and you are getting older, and we see this all the time, you've maybe left your run a little bit late, that can sometimes prompt you to want to take on more risk to try and get back on track than is really ideal for you. So there's a different set of circumstances. So if you're 55, and you're, you're in a position where you're right behind the eight ball. doesn't mean to say you've got to give up. You've just got to be very careful as to what you do. And chasing return is not the thing to do because, A, you're early into your journey in terms of the money you've got to work with, and that's where you want to accelerate it. And secondly, there's a very good chance that your skill set hasn't evolved either to be able to enable you to handle that. It's rather like buying a performance car. You know, if you buy a performance car, one of the first things that most solid brands do 
is put you through a performance driving course before you take delivery of that vehicle for one very simple reason. It stops you wrapping it around a lamppost. It's good to know. I'm currently in the market for one of those. That helps. Thank you. So enjoy your track time and learning how to drive the car, not to race it, but to understand how to properly control the power that's in it. And so that comes down to the same thing with investing. So there's a really different example of someone that might be in the same age group as perhaps me, but would have a different risk profile on the basis of their skill set. It's quite interesting, isn't it? I think mean, there's so many factors here to, 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 to actually make up that decision and hence why we train people in order to do this. Mm. Let's go through some case studies now, AB. Okay. Let's, put, let's put pen to paper here. So if we take, uh, let's pick a fun one. Let's take NVIDIA. Mm. I want, to, want you to assume for a moment here that you bought into NVIDIA at $10. You had 10 grand in that stock. Happy days now. <laughs> out of 100 grand. So let's go, use your example from the start. 100 grand portfolio, 10 stocks at 10 grand. NVIDIA happened to be one of those at 10 bucks. It's now trading at 40. Okay. So the great thing about NVIDIA is that it's one of those bigger liquid stocks where you have options available to them, uh, which, which makes your life in this instance much easier to manage from a portfolio asset. So, you know, you're in at 10. Let's say it got to 40 bucks, which it was at a couple of years ago. What's it worth now? 130, 140, something in that Ooh, sort of I think space? it's $138 so thereabouts so after the split. So currently 138 after the split. So it's way, way beyond that in, in, in reality. So you got to $40 and you're up 400% or 300% on your investment. And you're sitting there going, Stoked. okay, what do I do here? Do I sell some down to, to keep my original 10 grand, which is effectively free money if you take your profit off the table? and miss out on any further run in it. And, and this is now the fear and greed scales that we one, all have. It? Because there's, it's now 30 to 40% of your portfolio. It's yep. such a big component, but as you okay, say, there's well, a lot of profit there. That's, that's right. So it's had a great run and all that goes up sometimes comes down mm-hmm. and the tech wreck and technology newfangled and it'll move out of favor and AI will be history and then it'll be back to seven bucks or maybe goes bust because the accounts weren't as robust as it. And I missed this opportunity of locking in all this profit is the voice on one shoulder. That's the fear. On the other side of the coin, you're going, hang on, this is put on you know, a couple of hundred percent here in pretty short order, and it is the buzzword for where to invest in markets right now. I'd be a fool to cash out right now, because what if it does it again and then again? And this has got the potential to be life-changing wealth. Really, me. yeah. So maybe you should stay in. No, you don't. You should be getting out, taking money off the table. Yeah, you should. You should be buying more. And you imagine this is like going into a room where you've got you know, two or three TVs on different channels blaring in the background. It's very, very hard to have any clarity of thought against yep. that background. Yep. And so the easiest thing then is in action. Uh, and, and then you're running the risk of whatever the market serves up, good or bad. So I think it's always important to take control. So for the argument about, okay, let's take some cash off the table and realize profit. How, how, how can we offset this voice by mitigating risk, but absorb this voice of, hey, don't miss out on the opportunity. You were fortunate that you got in, and this could be way more than what it is. So for me, and this is one of the things why I love the derivatives markets, uh, would be to buy a put option. Um, Oh, that's a good idea. And by buying a put, so the stock's at 40, let's say you bought a $40 put, whatever it's cost you to insure that stock, which effectively is a put option, you can say, oh, I'm insuring this stock now for 40 bucks for the next 12 months. Which means you're guaranteed to sell at 40 bucks, better or worse. Yeah, so if the share price drops to 10, I can still sell for 40. For the next year. And over Any time over the next year. And look, it might be, and one of the advantages of options is you get a short-term pullback, and if you've got a stop or a sell order in the market, that could be triggered. And then you're out and then it recovers and runs away and you're pretty cranky with yourself. By buying a put, you've locked in that time frame to say, I've got all this time to decide if it temporarily dicks in there. It doesn't matter because I can still sell for 40 anyway, but let's just see what happens over the course of the year. I've paid for the insurance. I've got the luxury of time. And it will be a relatively small percentage of what you've made as profit. And it's giving you the ability to stay in the game with zero downside risk. And I appreciate, you know, the regulator may may not like the idea of zero downside risk, but if the stock's worth 40 and you've paid an amount of money to buy a $40 put, your, your risk is really the cost of the premium for the insurance, that's it. Which you've taken out of your profit you've anyway, right? Your profit. So you're effectively protecting everything that you've got. Now you've got the ability to stay in the stock in an overweight position where it's such a big part of your portfolio and you can satisfy. So this, this side of the conversation is really happy now. It's like, great, no downside risk. We can sleep at night. Good decision. This side over here, the opportunity side is great. Well, we can stay in this stock now with no fear of it going down and just see what happens. And that's an example of, of using, you know, the stock's 138 bucks now, which has been notwithstanding the split. So it's done very, very well, and it would have been a good play to be able to do that. And, and look, you could set within your trading plan then strategic levels to say, right, when it gets to 60, what I'm going to do is buy back that $40 insurance policy. 
uh, or, or sorry, unload it, sell it, and then buy some insurance at a higher level. And yes, it's going to cost you a little bit of money to do that. But all the while, it's kind of like a, a cable tie. You, you're tying it, it only goes one way, it's a ratchet strap. So all you're doing is locking in more and more profit, giving you more peace of mind, downside risk accommodated, and you can still have that free swing to the upside. Now, for smart guys like you that perhaps are a little younger and maybe a little bit more aggressive, one of the things you could do is what we call cash extraction. Oh, yeah. Read my mind, AB. Mm. So if you want to get back to having 10% of your portfolio in, in the video, you could sell the balance off and maybe buy some long-term call options for a very, very small fraction of the money that still gives you all of that upside potential. If the price moves higher, those calls go up and it's geared. I was so going to say can, the leverage very attractive. The for, leverage for me. would be very attractive for someone that's a little younger, and you've got the ability to continue to have that upside on steroids, but you've taken your cash off the table at the same time. Great idea. And this is how you get the rainbow and the storm taken care of by being educated about this. And if you're listening to this, going, I've no idea what you guys are talking about. Come to one of our trainings. Let us walk you through this sort of stuff because not knowing what to do or how to use these kind of professional tools is incredibly expensive financially by not learning that you could have done all of those things. But it's also incredibly expensive emotionally living that day-to-day -day movement in the market, which psychologically can really knock you about and, and leave you in a very, very high stress position. So there's a couple of ways of playing the video, protecting your profit and, and keeping the whole position running in a massive overweight way where you've got no downside, uh, or alternatively taking that gain off the table, buying a synthetic exposure that's geared to the long side, and you've got your cash off the table, which satisfies your risk management and your portfolio balance, and you still get the sprinkles on top of the cake with that upside on a geared way. Beautiful. Either way, brilliant trade. Love that. Let's look at a different example now. Let's completely flip this on its head. That was a big blue chip stock. Let's mm. take a small cap specy. Let's say you had a real crack at something that went from listing price up to a couple of bucks, maybe WA1, because I know we've got a couple of clients in mm. that stock. We have. We've got one particular client springs to mind, and uh, he'll be smiling as we talk about this, uh, <laughs> because he's had a, a position in WA1 really from listing, uh, and that stock's gone from you know, $0.20 cents a share to you know, over $21 at one point Oof, fairly recently. That's a big gain. Uh, and again, that's the notion you mentioned earlier about buying small caps. And I'm, I've never been a big small cap big small cap, there's a funny way of explaining. I've never been an enthusiastic small cap investor because they are quite speculative and that's never really suited my needs. I prefer to lay off risk on big caps and, and gear them up that way. Um, so he's in a situation where his portfolio is extremely skewed in that he's had this enormous surge in wealth in a stock. And you know when you get into those sorts of stocks, and he's had some really good advice on this, I might add, um, the temptation is, well, this could go further, which it probably could. At the same time, when's enough enough? These are the two voices Fear and greed, right? on the shoulder. Greed, the big one here mm. in that situation. Well, it, it is because the risk mitigation and the risk management on this really is a lot more difficult to control than something like NVIDIA, which is a very liquid big blue chip. So in the case of WA1, the, 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 the daily turnover in the stock is, is relatively low. And so if you decided to hit the exit button, given the position size he's got, it would take months to unload without really killing the market. And That's so, a tough one, isn't it? Because you've got so much stock at such a higher price. If you were to dump everything, then you could lose out on a lot, right? You're effectively going to kill the price and any buyer appetite because it's very obvious there's a big seller that's just saying... Top, un unload. And it's one of those orders, and I've, I've had them before in, in my time in London, that you know, uh, start selling, okay... Um, what price and, and what limit on it. And it's just keep selling. Yeah, but it's going to affect, I don't care. I just need out and I don't care what it does to price. I just need zero. Get me out. Get me out. I need zero holdings. And you start hitting it and you just watch the bid just dry up and, and the gap starts to widen and you're chasing it down, which is no fun as a broker trying to place trades like that. So what he's done, which is really strategic and, and very unemotional, uh, and this is, I guess, quite relevant to what we're talking about here, is he's just got a daily sell order every day, just a little bit each time. And just chicking away at going through and clearing that order out on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, that that's not necessarily going to affect the price because it's just a, now become a standard daily volume. That's, it's like a gradual rebalance, isn't yeah, it, really? Yeah, and it's going to take him some time to, to, to do that. And he's doing it in a way that he's had to be extremely patient with. And I'll say this with the best will in the world, he's probably not the most patient of personalities under different <laughs> I think circumstances. I know who you're talking about in that instance. And, and, and a lovely guy. Um, and he understands that about himself, but he's been very, very measured on this, which is enormous self-control. 
and um, and and so that can be the challenge when you've had a, a, a sort of blue chip, uh, sorry, a, a small cap run. And I've seen this firsthand. I mean, ninety nine. One of the things I used to like doing uh, in within the Aussie market wasn't a lot of what I did um, back in nineteen ninety nine buying up small cap mining stocks. Mining stocks weren't wanted. They were absolutely hated as a stock back then. And technology was the thing because of the dot-com boom and bust. So you'd have a whole bunch of Aussie mining stocks that were just listed entities that were worthless effectively. And investors or or tech companies were coming in and they were gradually acquiring them to reverse list into the ASX. It takes a couple of years to do a listing, whereas you can do it very quickly as a, a reverse. So we'd be buying stuff on that volume build up in there and taking advantage of the momentum that that buying pressure would have, which is great until you've got to try and exit. <laughs> uh, that was like sort of Sirocco, SRO. I remember that one, made a lot of money on that one. And nice. ne- Nexus was another one back then. So, you know, it's a different problem in illiquid small caps. And that's one of the reasons I don't trade small caps now because it's just too hard to to be able to get in and out at a way that you want to. And the beauty of the stock market is that liquidity, that ability to enter or exit it at your whim unlike property where there's a lead time uh, and, and other factors. So it makes gotcha. it very, very appealing from an asset class. So different scenario there. And he's doing the right thing. He's just cutting that weighting down and he'll keep a residual holding, I'm sure. Uh, and if it moves up to uh, you know, a really super high price level, he might be more motivated to unload that residual holding, but great trade. And it's just taking profit off the table in a very measured and controlled way. The good thing is he's looked ahead and he's doing it rather than waiting until I want to get out now. Gotcha. uh, And then you're stuck with a big lump of stock. Gotcha. Let's do one more if we Mm. can. And there's a a client. Yeah, absolutely. There's a client that springs to mind, Wayne, Mm. uh, Wayne down in New Zealand. Mm. Now, Wayne has quite an interesting strategy, as I'm sure you'll let our listeners know, where the profits from his leveraged holdings funds the principal holdings in his non-leveraged. Yep. So he does rebalance about every quarter. Uh, and I say about, uh, he, he's a smart operator, flying instructor, as is his wife, actually. So oh, wow. I wonder who flies if they get in a plane. Imagine it's like Yeah, when you, they just take turns, I guess, yeah, like who drives you'll on go the road today, trip. You'll go today, what do you feel like? You it's know. Quite, cool, quite a first world problem, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah. Really lovely people, both in Wayne and Ruth. And, uh, and so in this instance, uh, he's got a strategy that he's using, which is a very derivatives-based strategy. Uh, and it's one that we work on called Plant and Harvest. Again, on TQQ, actually, which is a nice high volatility geared NASDAQ ETF. Oh yeah, one of my favorites. Now, now this wouldn't be for everybody, but what he's using it for is just a flywheel for cash flow. So he's not holding it as an asset, he's just using it as a cash flow slave to generate and spin out cash flow. And then quarterly rebalances as that cash accumulates in the account. And also if there's a pullback actually, which is also quite a smart way of rebalancing it too, go straight into SPY, which is the S&P 500. Non-leveraged, Non-leveraged right? index tracker. So they're both index trackers. One is triple geared, the other one isn't. One is on the S&P, which is really the top 500 companies in Australia, uh, so a bigger button in the US, uh, the S&P 500, and, and these are big caps, and, and they're the more traditional part of the economy versus the NASDAQ, which is the more forward-looking part, I suppose. So that's a really good way, if you go back to principles of money management, we've got all these buckets of cash uh, sitting around. So that's your current account, that's your grocery bill, that's your electric, that's your savings. Doing the same way in a trading space to say, right, this bucket, as soon as it starts to overflow, first world problem, I'm going to then park it in this big bucket, which is my asset builder, which is my index tracker for the S&P. And, and these are all really very, nifty. very different ways of, of, of managing too much exposure to an asset that's done well. Equally, one thing we haven't touched on is what do you do when something's an underperformer? That's right, yeah. And if you're someone that's into portfolio rebalancing, let's say you've got a stock and it's just done terribly and we've all had our fair share of those, and you might go, look, it's only worth 3%, it should be at 10%. Do you throw more money after it, which is averaging down? And I've never been an advocate for averaging down. I just think it's throwing more good money after bad. You know, you're chasing the wind. It's not a good idea. In that instance, that's not something you'd necessarily look to bring back up to a full weight unless your view is really radically shifted. Now, if you hold an asset which has drifted down that much, one of the things you'd have to ask yourself is why haven't you hit the exit button previously? Where's your risk management been? when it comes to that particular asset? And is there an emotional overlay that stopped you hitting the exit button far earlier? And if there was, well, then there's a question mark over your analysis on that stock. You've got too much emotional attachment to the position. So adding more money to something you're emotionally attached to is a recipe for disaster. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. AB, I think that was a really good analysis on portfolio rebalancing. We've done a a blue chip a big cap, we've done a small cap, and then we've done an income style play too. And mm. you can see there's various ways that you can achieve that model portfolio or balanced portfolio that you're really wanting to get out of it. 
take what you want, leave what you don't. I mean, everyone is different in terms of the approach that they want to take. And I think our goal is to help our clients get to the finish line in good order, both financially, but just as importantly, mentally and emotionally, where they That's haven't right. been battered around with the market. And that notion of having those two voices on your shoulder, oh, I've been in this game a long, long time. <laughs> and you know something? Every now and then they'll chime in. They might echo because oh, yeah. they're a long way down in the cave. 100%. And gone, but they still chime in. And, and it's a constant battle to keep them out of the decision making. So, you know, to summarize, the more process that you have, so don't be doing this on the fly going, how am I going to do this? Spend the time before you get into the game working out what you're going to do under certain circumstances like this. And sure, you're going to refine and, uh, and adjust this. If I take Wayne's example with his Teachable Q and Spy, that's something he's refined. It's probably version five or six. I'm sure it's even more than that now to get it to the point where it is. But you've got to have something to start with. And if it's a process and a plan, it's going to be far more emotional, uh, far less emotional, should I say, than, than, than having those two voices on the shoulder knocking you left and right. And you just end up in an awful state when that's the case. Paralyzed, I guess, would be the thing. Don't end up there. Indeed. Great insight, AB. And to Stu and Jill, thank you very much for the topic. And that was a cracker. Absolutely. Anytime, mate. Pleasure. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit the notification button. And we'll look forward to hosting you next week.